Um, I am the main developer of Drum Gizmo. Um, cur currently the sole developer because all the others are too busy. Um, I tried to figure a smaller or shorter title for this talk. Um, and this was actually the short version. <laughs> um, what I'm about to, to talk about today is not so much Drum Gizmo because we already heard a bit about that, um, but more uh, the idea workflow, ideal workflow that I see and use myself as a musician with Drum Gizmo. Um, because 10 years ago when I made it, I had a very specific workflow in mind because this is, this is, I needed that and I made Drum Gizmo to sort of uh, supply that need. So, um, first of all, just to recap what drum, drum gizmo is, drum gizmo is a drum sequencer or sample play thingy. Um, most of you have probably heard about it in its uh, LV2 variant or VST, but in fact you can also run drum gizmo as a jack client or directly uh, connected to the uh, to either ALSA or OSS on FreeBSD. So you can use it for playing live if you want to, uh, without having to set up all kinds of processes. Um, the main reason why I made it was because I wanted something that could be, uh, be easy to use for playing samples on Linux, which didn't really exist. Um, and I wanted to be able to make my own drum kits. Um, the sample formats that existed back then were uh, too narrow for what I had in mind. So we made our own, which is entirely XML based. And as you just heard, changing stuff in Drum Gizmo can be a bit hard if you not really know your way around in a text editor. Um, and we try to remedy that in the UI and we will fix that eventually. Um, but other than that, I wanted to be able to just plot in MIDI notes at Re velocity 64, everything velocity 64 and timing perfect. And I wanted the plugin to be able to rework that into something more realistic as a drummer would play it for real. And so far we have managed to do a few of the ideas I have. Uh, uh, finally, we have, uh, we have the possibility to be able to stream the samples directly from disk because our sample libraries are huge. Um, I think the biggest one I have is above, above four gigabytes. Uh, and finally, which is it started out as a side project or something from from the main project, the GG Edit Drum Gizmo Editor, um, which, which was intended a dumb kit editor. Wow, <laughs> one of that is <laughs> that was certainly dumb. Um, but to be able to record your drum kit and have it automate the process of cutting up the recording into samples. Uh, and, and to make that into something that could be loaded by the plugin. And actually, what you're about to see here today is a world premiere of the new drum kit editor, because I've been working on that for... Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, we had the editor already, but it was one instrument only, and you couldn't save your settings, so it was one-off. You create the kit, you create the instrument, and if you're happy with it, you render it, and you forget about it. That wasn't really ideal, so... But we'll get to that. Okay, this is um, how a workflow could look for some people working on music. Uh, and this is, um, I don't know, you, maybe you do something different, but this is just an example of what I, ex what I see as a common workflow. So um, the music I play is uh, rock music. Actually, it's death metal. We'll come back to that later. But compared to rock music, compositional-wise, this is not very different. Because what we do is we create some riffs. We try to stitch those riffs together uh, to compose a song, a verse, uh, and so on. Uh, and we have to, of course, add some drums at some point to be able to figure out what would this sound like, what drum beat should be on it. Um, and classically, you would do that in MIDI drums, as we just saw in the last talk. Um, and you can rearrange the parts or add another chorus somewhere or perhaps a guitar solo or whatever. And then on some, at some point you're satisfied with the shape of the song or the, the components. Um, but 
if you use, um, for example, hydrogen or, or something else, um, then it's very hard at this point to get a really good idea about what, how will this song sound like when it's actually finished. Because the, the, the sound or the production of, of this composition um, is very rough. And sometimes you can, of course, if you know your tools very well, you can, you can imagine what they will be like. Um, but still it's very hard. Then you go on to record some cue guitar and you will put the drummer behind his drum kit and press the record button using those cue guitars. Um, and then you record the rest of it and you remix it and you'll, you're done. So, but this, this part here is what I'm, I'll be focusing on because this is what I want to change. I want, to, I want something very specific. And that's this. Um, still we compose riffs some way. In my band we do it using a, a, a smartphone, recording riffs while we're in the rehearsal room. And when we get back home we perhaps cut up those pieces directly and use them, or we re-record them using the telephone recording as a reminder of what the riff was sound like. Um, and we compose the drums and drum gizmo. Um, the difference from me and most users, I guess, is that I actually have a sample, a sample kit of the kit I have at home. Um, so what I get here is something very close to the real thing. Um, we rearrange stuff, but we also start mixing now, because what I have, the outputs from Drum Gizmo is, is exactly the same as if I recorded the drums for real. So I can start adding mixes to, to each output channel. Um, and when you get to this point, it's actually pretty easy to to hear what the sound what this song will sound like. Of course, all the other components are still missing, uh, but provided that the guitars and so on actually sound somewhat like the end result as well, then we can get a good idea of what this will end up sounding like. Um, then we can record the cue guitar, and if you use this cue guitar with the drum gizmo track. Somebody might actually be um, actually want to release it just then <laughs> and not record the drums at all. <laughs> but of course, that's cheating, so we record the drums still. But because the drum gizmo output is exactly the same, even the names of the channels, we can replace the outputs with the recorded tracks and reuse the mix we, we made here at step three, record the rest of the stuff, and then mix the rest of the record. This is this is my ideal scenario. This is was what I was aiming aiming at in two thousand eight. Um, this requires, of course, that you have a drum recording studio available with static microphone setup. And by that I mean you have a drum kit, you have microphones put up, you have a, a sound card uh, where you do not have to turn it off and move it out. You can leave it in place, so all the micro, uh, micro, microphone positions and the preamp levels, that's very important, stay the same. Because if you change that, then the output once you record the real drum kit will change and then you cannot just replace the tracks. And of course you need to sample that drum kit. And that has been an issue up until now because it's a kind of a tedious process and you really know to have to know your way around the tools uh, which weren't really that easy to use. This is my ro home recording studio, <laughs> my cave. Um, well, as you can see, I have, uh, of course, Arduo running on the monitor, 16-channel uh, output input, in, uh, divided by, uh, across uh, two personas sound cards, Firewire, and all the microphones are static. And um, a fair warning. Beyond this point lies something you might not like. Death metal is... <laughs> some, some people might not like it. I promise you I won't play much of it, so you'll be... <laughs> okay, what I'm about to show you is now an example session of how this could work um, based on something we did, uh, we released in, in the summer of 2016. Um, I'll walk through how to sample the drum kit uh, of course, I cannot record it here, but have a pre-recording with me. Um, uh, we will be cutting up that recording using the editor to create something that can be loaded into Drum Gizmo. 
And then, depending on how much time we have left, I'll try uh, to show you how to actually start composing and replace the tracks at the end. So, first of all, re recording a drum kit. Um, the recording process is, of course, you have to be, you know, you have to know your way around in a studio. You have to know your microphones and all that. But this talk will not touch much on that subject because it's, we can talk for hours about that at all, alone. Um, but what you can see here, um, we have uh, 16 channels. Uh, each channel is labeled. We have two ambience microphones, a hi hat microphone. I have two kick drums, so one for each. Then I have a trigger channel, which will just play a sample. Two overhead microphones, uh, right, and two snares, one on the top and one on the bottom, and then one for each of the toms. And what we record when we record a when we try to sample a s or capture a single instrument is all 16 channels. Uh, usually this is called bleed because what what's in the uh, kick drum microphone when I when I hit the snare that's not really the snare but still it adds something to 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 the overall reduction. Um, this is just a number of snare hits. It's not really that interesting to hear I think, but I can play one here anyway. Woo. Um, what we do when we want to sample the kit is simply hit it repeatedly. Um, and as you can see here, I try to increase the uh, the power for the hits. This doesn't have to be uh, monotonically increasing. The editor will figure it out on it uh, on its own. But doing it this way is, is simply a way to make sure that you didn't have a lot of soft notes and then a lot of hard notes and then a hole in the middle. You want to have have hits on all levels from very soft to very hard. Otherwise, the, the output won't be very good. Um, the distance between each hit needs to be long enough for the ring out of the, especially the cymbals are hard, because it can take a minute. If you hit a right bell, it just keeps on ringing. And you have to wait until it's done, until you, know, until you do the next one. Um, <laughs> particularly for the hit for the right, it can be very hard to sort of muscularly remember how hard did I hit it the last time. Now I have to hit it a little bit harder. Oh shit! So but that that's that's tricky, and you have to do it right. Um, for snares and um, mainly for snares, I recommend using at least thirty hits. Uh, for the cymbals, it can be much less because the cymbals are not that uh, their timber is not that easy to, to detect with the ear. So if you have two identical samples with the same symbol plate in a row, you are less likely to notice it. But the snare, because we have fast snare fills and stuff like that, often uh, the snare is much easier to perceive as a machine gun if it repeats the same sample. So many, many samples on the snare, fewer on the symbols. That's a general uh, uh, rule of the thumb. So once we have this, we can fire up there. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the drum gives my editor. Um, what we see here is um, our loaded uh, a, a session I made earlier. Um, this one just contains three uh, instruments, two kick drums and a right uh, right cymbal. I have predefined a lot of channels, and this is very tedious work. I plan to automate this in the future, but I haven't done so yet. But the idea is to simply um, click the plus symbol, and then it will ask you for a name, and you can add it. These are the channels as seen on the output side of Drone Gizmo. Um, so all instruments should play into these somehow. You can con consider them output channels from jack, for example. 
whereas the instruments, they live on the inside and have to be connected to these. So let's make a new instrument. We make a snare. And so first of all, we add some files. And this is the recording we just saw in Ardor. So these are all the channels, um, ranging, oh, ranging from Ambience to Tom4. Let me just close this. Um, so we see here, this capital M here is the master channel. Um, this will be the channel that the editor uses for analyzing where the sample hits are. Um, and because this is a snare, I want to use the snare top microphone. So this is the channel we also saw before in Ador. Um, also, I want to map these names here, are the names uh, we describe as instrument channels, and these are the outputs from the instrument, and we need to feed those into the output channels for, for the drum kit. So here on here is the kit channel. I can select the corresponding ones, and this is also very tedious. <laughs> but you just carry on downwards, uh, and once you're done, the, the engine will know how to map each of the instrument channels to the output of drum gizmo this will be reflected in the XML file. And if you imagine you import samples for a completely different recording session with a different setup, different drum kit, different microphones, some, something like that, you might want to figure out how do I want to do these mappings, but you can map them yourself. Um, one of the newer features we have in Drum Gizmo is bleed control. You can actually pull the lever and reduce the bleeding. and in order to be able to achieve this, um, we define for each of the instruments which channels are to be considered the main channels for the instrument. And for the snare, for example, that would be that would be the snare bottom, the snare top microphones, and also the ambience microphones. Everything else is considered non-main channels or bleed channels. Um, so the idea is, once I load in this instrument into drum gizmo, I can reduce the bleeding, and the snare sample itself will be reduced in all the other channels. So it won't turn down the drum in the main channels, but it will sound less in the overhead channels, for example, which some people have been having trouble with mixing and such, because the bleed can be very hard to control. Um, so the next step is to have the editor figure out where all the hits are. Um, we have two bars, one at the top and one at the bottom. It's basically the same one, you can see if I move it, I move both. And what I do with mouse now is I simply drag it until I hit, have each of the peaks in all the hits. And if I zoom in a bit, it's a bit easier to see what's going on. Zoom up here a bit. What it does then is that it detects um, the point where the peak goes above the threshold I just said. Um, which is probably, this point is very hard to see, there are like four pixels here. Yeah, here we're zooming. It's very hard to control at this zoom level. Okay, maybe you can see it here. It detects the hit, the 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 the, the peak here, and then it, then it traverses backwards in the sample until it finds a zero crossing. A zero crossing is where the sine wave crosses the zero boundary, and the idea is if we cut, if you imagine we cut it here where the sample value is very high, when the sample is then played back from silence, a point where it's silence, the speaker will pop. You can actually hear this rise in sample value. But if you cut where the, where the sample has a zero crossing, uh, you cannot hear this pop. It doesn't exist. So it does this for each of the hits. Uh, 
and then I can click the generate button and it will it will collect all these areas but before that we have a few other parameters we can tune uh, first of all yeah, yeah we can do more <laughs> purely coincidental <laughs> You may find the number 42 in the source code now and again also. Um, if we can, we can tune the fade length. You can see the blue lines here. Um, this fade is applied after the cutting. And it is intended because if you, if you just use very long samples, and this is, again, this is particularly um, uh, true for, for the symbols, if you just allow the, the symbol to ring on forever, you'll get a 20, 30 second ride symbol ringing. And if you then have a beat where the, where the symbol is playing fast, uh, you will have accumulating ride symbols over these 13 seconds or 30 seconds. And that's, yeah, you'll run out of CPU power at some point. So the idea is to, to reduce it. We have this fall off parameter. Fall off is um, it tries to detect the power initially, and it reduces until some percentage. So it goes beyond uh, eighty percent, I think, of the original signal. So you can see by increasing the fall off, I can reduce the sample length. But if I intend to do a very uh, short sample because I want to preserve memory or preserve CPU power, um, I can put it up too high. If I do this and play it, it will sound caught off. And so in order to prevent it from actually be caught off, we add this, um, this possibility to, to actually do a fade out at the sample at the end. So you can control that as well. Um, exactly what these values mean in terms of physics or math or powers or whatever, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> Just play around with them. Um, for some reason, I cannot make the editor play back on my laptop. I think it has something to do with pulse audio, <laughs> so I cannot play it. But what we can, can do, if you can manage to get it working, you can click this play samples button. And down here, all these blue circles, they are the power detected by the editor, because the algorithm in, looks at the initial sample values. This is controlled using the sample attack length. Um, if I move this, you can see the, the blue dots, they move around here at the bottom. So that's because some uh, floor tom, for example, has a very uh, low rumbling frequency, so it has a lot of power. Um, but what you need to figure out is how, this is in milliseconds, by the way, uh, how many milliseconds should, no, that's not true, I think it's samples, I don't know. <laughs> but you can control the, the amount of initial samples for the editor to look at in order to calculate the power of this single hit. And this value, of course, changes uh, if you increase the number of samples you observe. And it does that for all the his hits and positions them at the, in the line at the bottom. Um, so you can see, okay, perhaps you have a, a large cluster of samples very near to each other in, in an area where you're not really interested in having many samples. And other places like like this, you might have holes, and and you do, you generally don't want that because if you have a velocity when you play it back that hits exactly at this point, it will jump to either this sample or this sample by some probability. So holes is a bad thing. Uh, clusters, you don't really need them. You cannot use them for anything interesting anyway. So you probably want to get rid of them. But let's generate it. We can go to edit, and here I can actually select one. And it's very hard to see at this monitor, but over here, there's a yellow dot. So I can see that this particular sample is mapped to this particular dot. Um, I can also sell, select one here. Um, if I zoom back out, I can. So the dot I clicked here, uh, what was it? Here, is actually this hit. And I can say, okay, I have, have a cluster of samples here, so I don't want them all, so I can press delete, and it will go away. Or at least, it should. <laughs> I 
There we go. So you can remove samples from the library that way, or from the from the pool of samples. If you press the play samples button, it will not only play the samples, but it will try to, to position them um, with the same span between them. So you get a sort of a flow. It will be like da -da 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 -da. even though one of the hits are longer, it won't prolong the spacing between those samples. And that enables you to actually hear if something stands out. Perhaps if you put the, um, the attack length too high, it might have calculated two samples so it they actually perceived the other way around. Then it'll be da -da 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 there's something wrong, then you can go back and fix it. So you should have a, a linear ramp up in intensity. And once you're done with that, the in instrument is finished basically. Um, so we can save the project, which is new. <laughs> um, and then finally, we can export. Um, so what it does now is it looks at the master channel for each in instrument, tries to use all the selections we made, and cuts up all the samples on all 16 wave files. And then puts these cutoff samples into one wave file with 16 channels. So we go from 16 mono samples to one 16 channel sample containing only one hit. Um, and we can have a look at that in the so this is a snare instrument and in the samples folder we have all the 31 snare hits that it detected these files are not immediately playable by you but most audio players because if you just feed this to something it will say oh I don't know what to do with 16 channels but it is just wave files there's nothing magical about them uh, what is convenient for the drum gizmo engine is that because those 16 channels are layered in the same file they are also very close to each other on the hard drive which makes it easy to, for us to, to actually do disk streaming without having to move the disk head very, very far around on the hard drive So that's it for the editor. Um, so now we imagine we have a full drum kit assembled, and luckily I have one already. <laughs> Incidentally, yes. Um, um, let me just make a new one. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to have a clean order session. We want to add a MIDI track. And to this MIDI track, we want to add the Drum Gizmo plugin. And then we want to load the R S E R star no sonai. Here we go. Um yes. So now what I think is the most oh Why is this just a stereo output? That's weird. Uh, I have no idea. I haven't worked with this version of Ardor. I don't usually do. Here? Oh. Ah, okay. Great. Um, Chrome Gizmo has 16 outputs. 
regardless of how many output samples output channels are in the uh, actual drum kit. Um, so if you only have eight output uh, channels in your drum kit, uh, the remaining eight channels will simply be, be empty and remain so. What one would new normally do, I think, at this point is create buses for each of these outputs. But because of the workflow where we want to replace the tracks later on, instead of having drum, having drum gizmo uh, play into a bus, we'll actually have it play to the input for a uh, recording channel. So we can actually uh, create 16 channels and oh no, that, that's one on. I really love this feature. <laughs> yes. <laughs> At this point one would start uh, renaming the ne these channels to the same microphone names as we had before. Um, and because then you can later on start actually mixing from that. Um, uh, let's see, it should. I think you need to make the audio tracks Listen on the monitor input. Oh, yes, you have to read. Like. We can make a group of them. Yes, exactly. Well, still, the samples, this should play something. Oh, no, it doesn't. There, there we go. It's just a weird place to put it. Okay, so that's the drum kit, and now we can start composing. Um, let's see, what time was it? How much time have you left? Half an hour. Okay, I'm good time. <laughs> um, That's funny. I thought I had it here. No? Okay, what I would usually do at this point is uh, import the guitar tracks or perhaps record them um, for, for the cue guitar and then compose the drums using MIDI. Um, I usually just use the mouse with the editor directly in order. I know a lot of people give it a lot of heat. <laughs> Um, but I've I've gotten used to it. I think it's okay to work with. Um, and rearranging stuff is pretty easy. It has um, one cool feature that I would actually like to show you is let's say we have some. Oh, we need focus of notes here. If we imagine we have this piece and we want to uh, copy it and use it multiple times after each other, we can just hold down the control key and drag it. And this will not copy the section as such. It will make links to it, to the original one. So if I just decide to add another node here, bam, it shows up on the rest of them. Yes? You, you can certainly do that. You can also, if you later decide, okay, this is, I need to change just this once, um, you can unlink from other copies. Now this is its own own beast, so if I do something here, it won't be affected in the other ones. 
Um, and this particular feature, I really like that. I, I use that a lot because most of the songs I make have the same passage going over and over and repeating. And if I change something at the beginning, I want it to be changed in all of them. I don't want to have to copy them all, all over again. So if you imagine we have been working on this for some time, um, and here comes the death metal part. <laughs> Fair warning. <laughs> uh, another disclaimer, uh, I took this session from my studio computer at home, which is a pretty powerful rig, and put it onto this Chibo laptop. So it's, um, it's having a bit of difficulty playing back what I'm trying to do. Um, this is an example of a piece where I was a bit in doubt about how should the drums be in this piece. And how I had an idea, sort of a vague feeling of what things would be like. Um, and I wanted to, to figure out how would this work for real before deciding. Uh, in particular, it's this tom part here. As you can see, it's orange. That's because Drum Gizmo didn't give me the reality of really hitting hard as I wanted it to. Um, so this is set to the input meaning that all the this group is playing back what drum gizmo feeds into it. So what you're hearing now is the drum gizmo drums. So what I wanted to experiment with was the power of this dun 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 da. I wanted it to be really, really powerful. And I, f I thought this way of combining the toms worked pretty well. Um, so then I went into the studio and recorded it. And this is what it sounded like. So you can see this is, yeah, thank you. <laughs> and this is just this is just a slow part. <laughs> but okay, of course, what you heard here well, for for the recordings of the guitars and bass is the the actual recording. This is not the Cure guitars, um, but. Still, the, the Q guitars were recorded with the same pedals and so on, so they were pretty close to the real, real result as well. Uh, so already at the composition phase, I could do some mixing. I had an idea of how much reverb I should put on those toms and so on. Um, and I also need, knew how, how much power I should put into them when I actually had to play them for real. Um, so very early on, as I originally intended, I had a good idea about what this would be like. Um, yeah, that's basically it for, for the for the walkthrough. Um, I don't know if you want, you want to hear more. <laughs> Fast part. Okay. Well. Maybe we should increase the jack buffer. I don't know what did I do now. I want to go back to the beginning. Uh, the buffer is already at 4096, so... <laughs> okay, so here goes the, again, the drone gizmo version. Okay, was that fast enough? <laughs> and this is the recorded part.
you can you can hear the rest of it online. Everything is for free at seedofheresy.com. Creative Commons, if you like. <laughs> okay, that was it. So, are there any questions? Yes. <laughs> can we give just the drums in AB? Uh, I can try. And then for the drunkest ones, I should of course have done it the other way around. <laughs> The snare is much more powerful in the drum gizmo version, so apparently I'm not hitting hard enough. <laughs> it's a bit straining. Yes, other questions? Should we pass around the microphone? Um, about the DG editor, mm -hmm. DG edit, um, that part about detecting uh, sample onsets and uh, cutting samples up. I imagine that would be very useful for other sampling uh, tasks as well, sampling synths, sampling real instruments. Uh, did you develop that yourself or is, is it, uh, is yes. that, can that be used in other programs or how hard would that be? Well, the technique is very simple, mm. um, exactly more or less like 20 lines of code or something like that. So it could easily be extracted from the editor and used in some other context. Um, I have no immediate plans of making it as a library because it's too simple for that purpose. But then again, you never know. Well, it's, it's not about uh, only about the uh, algorithm, but uh, having an interface for it. Uh, I think that's ah. the dif difficult part because I haven't found... Uh, any good tool on Linux to cut up samples. I'm still using a Windows tool that which doesn't even run under Wine, which is very unfortunate. Hmm. <laughs> uh, you can use the editor for uh, without having the onset detection, mm -hmm. but just for the cutting, and you can mark the areas using your mouse. But you don't want to do that for drums because you it's very hard to be very precise, and especially the, with the with the zero zero crossing stuff. Um, but you can certainly use that for it, yes. Um, oh. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you said that if you had uh, a lot of symbols uh, playing after each other, uh, if you didn't have the, the uh, cutoff or, or the, the, the uh, how do you call it again? The, the uh, the ring out. The ring out uh, uh, that you might have 20 or 30 samples playing at the same time and your computer imploding. But I was wondering, wouldn't it be more physically correct to actually stop playing the uh, uh, previous symbol sample as you hit the next one because the previous one would be dampened by the that's next good, hit? That's a good question. Um, actually, no, because the symbols accumulate. They do this for real also. What you do when you hit it the second time, you probably uh, alter the timber of the second note, but you don't dampen the first one. So this is actually how, how physically how a symbol is working. What we do do, though, is that we have um, um, we have auto mute groups in the, in the um, in the format. So if you have an open hi hat playing and you use a foot to close it, which is also a sample and a media note, it will choke the first one. You can also catch a symbol if you hit it and snap it with the hand. That's also a note, and you can do that also in the editor or in the, uh, in the with the plugin. Thank you. But other than that, I might just add it's not it's not playing twenty four samples on, on top of each other. It's playing ten thousand <laughs> because it's sixteen channels for each hit and accumulating over. If you take a piece like I just played for you, fast blast beat. 230 beats per minute. That's uh, times four because it's six, no, 16 notes. 
So that's, yeah. I think I measured 10,000 simultaneously playing samples in Rome Gizmo at once. Other questions? Yes. Um, I wanted to say that I've been recording some drum kits and sampling them and okay. cutting this up manually. And the tool you showed us, I think it's amazing. And it like makes, I think it make, can make creating drum kits just fun. <laughs> <laughs> there are like a few areas where it could be made better, like assigning the the, re the recorded samples of different mics to the instrument outputs mm -hmm. of drum gizmo i i think that could be like somehow it can be automated automated to yeah, to yeah, be yeah. like recognize the same well, names i would like to tell a short anecdote here because when i made the very first drum kit or i recorded the very first drum kit drum gizmo didn't even exist because i did that for the Aussie monster kit back when i recorded a, um, a record in 2010, I think. Drum Gizmo wasn't, didn't even exist back then, more or less. Um, but then when I got to a point where I actually needed the samples, I had to cut them up and I had no tool for that. DG Edit didn't exist back then. I had to do that manually. It took me three months to cut up the entire kit. And I had to do it manually using Audacity or something, I can't remember. Yeah. And the, re and the worst part, the result was really bad because the precision was way off, everything was all over the place. Um, now I can do the exact same work in like five minutes. <laughs> so yes, it is tedious to assign the channels, but it doesn't really take that much time. It's just something that it should be avoided and we will definitely work on, on, on finding a way to do that. I also wanted to ask if if you're composing parts for your drummer, but now I know you are your own drummer. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> But I wanted to ask if you, if you could hand out your session to a different drummer and he could learn from that. Uh, or maybe after some time even like um, play, just watching your, your piano roll, just knowing what, what oh, note you, is what. The MIDI notes, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah certainly. Um, I have another band where we actually do the composition stuff, uh, Creative Commons or open source. So we use Git uh, to compose stuff in. And we put the MIDI files in there with the other sessions. Um, and of course, Drum Gizmo. Um, we haven't gotten very far, but that's another talk for another time, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering about uh, the kits that are hosted on the Drum Gizmo website, mm -hmm. and more specifically, whether now, so with the Drum Gizmo editor, I guess it will become easier and probably there will be more kits available. So I was wondering about whether maybe people already tried, well, reached um, reach the Drum Gizmo team to, in order to share uh, sampled kits and whether Drum Gizmo would be interested in distributing more kits through the website. Definitely, definitely. We have been um, working on an idea of somehow making a community site for this so people can upload their own drum kits. Um, we have tons of capacity for this. And would be cool for people to exchange kits and vote for kits or do presets for them, stuff like that. Um, but the downside is that I'm only I'm the only developer at the moment. <laughs> so if I had to do that also, yeah. no, not really feasible. If any of you guys would want to join and participate and help out in that area, it would be really cool. Uh, So these are the current kits. Um, the Artstar kit, which you just saw, has not been uploaded yet. I haven't finished it. So, yes, um, Ben, you said that the um, actual recording of your kit, one of the toughest jobs, is still to evenly distribute your um, hit strengths across the full range from pianissimo to fortissimo. Uh, fortissimo. Uh, I was wondering, did you consider or even try using solenoids to mechanically? Increase the the velocity. I guess this is still too mechanic because it's sitting on the same spot. But would exactly. that be possible? Yeah, yeah, but you're right. With the same spot, it would sound too close to each other. So this the the a, a big part of what randomization is is also how it adds to the humanization because you don't if you hit the snare twice in a row, you don't hit the exact same spot. So the timber from the snare itself will change, 
and using a robot for that might be too precise, I'm afraid. But uh, I think we actually talked about this before. <laughs> Maybe it should be a non-precise solenoid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> great, uh, great software. I'll probably use it. You probably thought about this or said it, but maybe I misunderstood. But it pertains to what Jan asked about. Uh, you know, the you can't have things ringing forever. I was thinking if you're doing a, a, a progressive rock song or something where you have a lot of different drums. Well, not styles, but lengths of hits. I was thinking if you actually want to have a thing ringing for 15 to 30 seconds and then later you want a more quickly kind of a ride thing or whatever, how do you address that problem or is it even a problem? Um, we don't address it currently. No? Um, okay. But if you have a, a computer which is just slightly more powerful than this one, mm -hmm. which I think most people have, yeah. it won't be an issue. Okay. How, um, how would you go about doing that? You mean how what? How would you go about doing that or solving that problem so that it doesn't accumulate over time? Oh, but what? it but it will and and it oh, should. Okay. What what we uh, what we're aiming for is something to sound as natural as possible, and that's what the drums do physically in in real life. So so we don't want to dampen them. Of course, you can do a an effect uh, where you perhaps uh, put the stick on the cymbal and and choke it partially or stuff like that, but you would have to do samples to, for, the, for, for that effect to be introduced. Okay. Um, I, I can't really see right now how to do that actually, but... Yeah, but it shouldn't be a problem yeah. in your mind? It, it should be possible, yes. Yeah, cool. Great. Um, a bit similar, a bit related to his question, um, do you address different styles of... Um, for example, playing the hi hat, usually you play it, the on beat is a bit played a bit differently than the off beat. For example, is there any way to address that with drum gizmo? Um, you would have to um, you would have to use uh, varying uh, velocities on on the sample notes in order to achieve something like that. But I do that very often actually um, for accentuations and stuff like that. But different playing styles, um, we have I think the DRS kit, for example. Um, this guy here, um, a very versatile kit where we try to uh, not only hitting each drum but also he hitting it with um, at different spots for, for the kick drum. A question I have heard a lot: there are two kick drums in the MIDI input, and people ask, "What are what the diff? There's only one kick drum. Well, they're two different input nodes. That's because there are two different playing styles. Um, one where they with the mallet or a beater." stays on the on the playing head on the drum head and one way it snaps back and this gives two two different sounds because the first one is actually dampened and the second isn't so that's that could be one of way of, of doing this simply have different samplings of the same drum but with different playing styles um, we could also use um, uh, brushes we have brushes on this kit same drum again but with a brush instead of a a, a drumstick we do that for the whole kit. You can use mallets or whatever. Um, it will increase the number of MIDI notes you have to map into something, of course, um, which is kind of a problem when relating to, to general MIDI, for example, because I don't think general MIDI has brush on Tom 1. <laughs> it doesn't exist, so we cannot really, we cannot really use that, but yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so you can do that. Um with the same number of channels, so 16 channels in drum gizmo, but using different um, instruments and... Certainly, certainly, yes. Okay. And the limits to how many instruments you can have is actually only limited by the amount of MIDI input notes. So I guess that's 127 or something. Well, okay. Uh, I have some uh, uh, audio engineering questions. How do you encounter those problems with phasing, for example, when you are using the ambience microphones? There will be for sure some delay from the ambient microphones to the direct microphones. How do you compensate this? 
Um, usually the way I use the ambience microphones is to add the room. So what I do is I add a, a ton of reverb on top of those um, and then only slightly increase them in the mix. So the effect, the, the phase problem you, you were talking about should be very small. Yeah. Um, oh. But of course it's present and I think there are tons of ways to handling that. Um, I don't know, <laughs> don't know much about it. So. Yeah, no, no, normally I have heard uh, uh, from uh, uh, the commercial products that uh, the engineers are going to uh, align all those ambience recordings uh, uh, to the uh, attacks of all the other instruments. Well, okay. And the other thing, uh, you are using top and bottom microphones for the snare drum. So mm -hmm. one of the microphone has to be turned in face by 180 to 180 degrees so that you get no phasing problems. How do you solve this? Uh, Ardor has a phase inversion button. Uh, you have to do this in Ardor then. What 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 we output from the drum plugin is exactly the same as you would get if you record the drum for real. Ah. So you have all the same problems with there's the no bleeding, with the phasing, yeah. everything. There's no further processing. Uh, nothing. After. Of okay. course, you could mm -hmm. optionally you could do that. There's nothing yeah. preventing you from doing it. But our first philosophy in the project is we want to output something as raw as possible. Ah, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, mm -hmm. um, and actually, that's one of the things that sort of um, distinguishes drum gears compared to some of the proprietary plugin plugins. That they are many of those are uh, as, as, as far as I know, they are pre-processed. So you have EQs, yeah, you have yeah. reverbs, you have all yeah. tons of things. So you cannot EQ it differently because mm -hmm. you cannot undo that EQ. It has mm -hmm. already been apl applied. So you can use this drum kit as raw, mm -hmm. and then you can give it your own sound. You can design yeah. it the way you want it to. So it gives gives the the the, the it gives you more freedom with respect mm -hmm. to 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 mm -hmm. how you want things to sound, mm -hmm. and that's of course both a weakness and a, a benefit because some people may may not be skilled in this area, and they end up with shitty sounding drums. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Now uh, I get clear. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Last question. Um, I've heard something about a. A thing called a midnam file. File. Midnam file. Yes. Yeah. Is is that like uh, the way to change the notes names to something meaningful for programming drums? Like it's actually so, uh, what you see here. If it, I when I hold the mouse here, is this a two? Yes. Yes. If I make a midnam file for this particular kit and load it into Ardor, it will say snare here. Oh, nice. So, so Drum Gizmo supports that, right? That has nothing to do with Drum Gizmo. That's something you put into Ardor. So you would have to do midnam files for all the drum kits. And actually, we have one of our users who actually did that. So you can download midnam files. I think it's on the Linux forum list somewhere. Um, we are in the process of trying to figure out how to put those on the website. And they may already be there. I'm not sure. but. Um, also, there is a plan for extending the LV2 standard to be able to dynamically assign MITNAM uh, to a plugin. The problem we have with LV2 all the time is that when you load up the plugin, it doesn't, you haven't loaded the drum kit yet. So it doesn't know anything about MITNAM or output channels or anything. It has to assign those at startup. Um, but we've been working with Robin and, and David, for example, by figuring out could we do something dynamic so we can assign when you load the drum kit, it will dynamically assign the midnam that corresponds to that drum kit generated from the drum kit file because all the data is there, but it's not; it doesn't exist yet. But the midnam you can do those already. Yes. Okay. Uh, does the drum gizmo editor like can it generate the midnam files? Certainly, it could. It oh. can't, but it may be able to do so sh right. shortly. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you again. Great talk. Thanks.